And you're telling me Abdul Al Malik minted that coin? Uh, we know it was a Muslim who minted the coin yeah. because it says along the top in Arabic, there is no God but Allah, just above wow. the Jewish menorah. The Quran is obviously comes from the Judeo-Christian culture. It couldn't make it any more obvious. Uh, with all these references to the biblical characters, it couldn't make it any more obvious that this is a Judeo-Christian text. But the thing is, if you look at the coins, you, you, you've shown us an example of a coin there er, uh, earlier on. Like if you look at many of the coins during the Umayyad era, you have crosses on the coins. Yeah. Um, and, and that makes no sense if the standard Islamic narrative is true. The, the, the traditional Islamic narrative is not somebody exaggerating. It is, there's no doubt, it's a deliberate lie, it's a concoction, and it has fooled one quarter of the world's population. So, if there are any Muslims watching this video who want to show me a coin minted in the first century of Islam, I would love to hear from you. But when Abdul Malik wanted to symbolize his reign, he didn't look, go to the Hijaz, he found a symbol of the Jerusalem temple and said, I want this symbol to represent my reign. Hi there everyone, I'm Mel, I'm from Origins, formerly known as Sneakers Corner. I'm here with Paul Ellis. Hello, I'm Paul. And uh, Paul is famous for the Jerusalem thesis. You may be aware that um, in the Quran it talks about um, the Kaaba and the, the Masjid al-Haram and so forth. But Paul has got a different um, idea around all of that. Obviously we know that the 7th century there was no Mecca. So whatever the Quran was talking about, it wasn't somewhere way down in Mecca. But Paul, you've a, a, a different idea about where that was. Do you want, like to talk us through on that one? Yeah, well, the Quran talks about a place, towards a, particularly the later Quran that uh, saw us, talks about one particular place and it calls it the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred place of prostration. And it also calls it uh, the Holy House, or sometimes God's House, and it sometimes calls it the Station of Abraham, or the Kaaba. And the traditional Muslim belief is that this all relates to Mecca in the Hijaz, but as you say, there's not a shred of evidence that Mecca even existed at that time. There are no coins, no references to it on any documents or maps, not a shard of pottery, nothing has ever been found. And very Mecca. little water there as well, yeah, which yeah. wouldn't support um, a culture or a people there. So that's another yes, Patric negative on, on that. Patricia Crone has pretty much demonstrated uh, that not only didn't Mecca exist, but Mecca couldn't have existed. There was just no potential there to keep any sound of settlement going. So, so where is this place? Well, what's the clues in the Quran? It tells us that this place was, um, uh, the foundations were laid by Abraham and Ishmael. It tells us that this is a place from where um, its Quranic audience have been expelled from and was their order to fight to regain. It tells us that there is a pilgrimage there um, and that during the pilgrimage people offer sacrifices and they do, uh, they circumambulate somewhere and it tells us that people used to shave their heads when they went there. And all these clues all tie in with the Jerusalem Temple. So the Jerusalem Temple was the center of, or the destination of pilgrimages in the Bible. Um, when people went to the, on the pilgrimages, they would circumambulate the temple. People would have sacrifices there. Uh, the Nazarite um, oath in the um, Book of Numbers, chapter six, talks about shaving your head when you complete the Nazarite oath. Um, and all these factors seem to suggest that it's Jerusalem. And actually, just on that point, you mentioned about you know going on pilgrimage. The Hebrew word for pilgrimage is hag, which yes. would be equivalent to the borrowed um, Arabic term hajj. So that's another suggestion there that there's a link. Absolutely. And um, the Quran talked about during the pilgrimage, one of the factors on the pilgrimage is you have to wear garlands or, ca or carry garlands. He uses this phrase, uh, kaleida, I think it's a word, and it's translated normally as, as um, it's translated as garlands or, or, um, or anything means we woven together. And well, I wonder what kind of garland you're likely to be able to put together in 7th century Arabia. If you go to one of the most arid places on earth, where you, hardly a blade of grass grows there. You know, actually, what kind, what kind of garland? Yeah, there's a garland of stones. Where, where are you going to find this garland there? 
but in the Jewish tradition, based on the uh, book of Leviticus, as you circumambulate the temple, you're supposed to carry uh, what they call, a, 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 I forget the name now, the Lilov, uh, it's a bound together um, a plant arrangement with four different plants, a willow and, uh, yeah. and the, something else, I, I forget, I'll, yeah. I'll spur the moment. Um, but but they, the Jews would circumambulate the temple seven times carrying this plant. It's exactly what we see in the Quran talking about, and again, completely inconsistent with, uh, with Mecca. But like, Muslims might say, well, what about Safa and Marwa? Safa and Marwa is, is supposedly Mecca. Now, if you were um, Gulliver from Gulliver's Travels, you could probably understand Safa and Marwa as mountains, maybe, if you're like a little miniature. But there's a bit of a, an anomaly there in Mecca that they are calling these places mountains, when in reality, they're just rocky outcrops at best. But, so, how would that fit in with Jerusalem as a, as a likely place for the origin of, of the Quranic reference to Safa and Marwa? Just talk us through that. Well, the Jerusalem temple is built around the, uh, the, the rock, the foundation stone of the temple, which is the natural summit of Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, when uh, Abraham is tested and is um, uh, told to sacrifice his son Isaac. He takes his son to where the God is going to show him where, it is, where, where to sacrifice his son, and this is a, a mountain in the land of Moria. Well, I would say uh, Moria is, is Marwa. And actually, uh, that has been confirmed by a number of Arabic speakers, that actually Mar Marwa is the Arabic equivalent to the Hebrew Moriah. So there's yeah. one link. What about Safa? And, and Safa, yeah, the opposite, the, um, the, the, the hill, Mount Moriah, has got the temple on, uh, they then got the Kidron Valley to its, uh, to its east, and beyond that we have the Mount of Olives. Well, the Mount of Olives isn't actually a single mountain, um, it's, a, it's a mountain ridge, and the high point of it is known as the Mount of the Watchmen. Now, it's got a Hebrew name, uh, Sophim, and it's often translated now into Greek as Mount Scopus. But, back in the day, one of, uh, one of the most famous Jewish authors uh, was Josephus, he wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, and he referred to this mountain as Safa. Safa, wow. So, so that, there is your Safa. So we have the so two oldest references. What well, you're saying, basically, two oldest references to Safa and Marwa, they're contained in the Bible mm -hmm. and in Josephus. Yes. So we're talking at, at least 2,000 years history there, but there's long more. before Islam. There is more. Tell yes. me more. I'll tell you more. But when Josephus talks about uh, Safa, he's talking about it within the context of um, Alexander the Great coming and conquering Jerusalem. Now, Alexander the Great appears in the Quran in the form in Surah 18 in the form of Dulkarnain, the two-horned one. The story of Dulkarnain in the Quran is clearly adapted from the legend, the Syriac legend of Alexander the Great. Syriac legend of Alexander the Great. Alexander goes to the land of the rising sun, the land of the setting sun, and he goes to a land where he meets a, a tribe of, uh, of savages called Gog and Magog, and he builds a wall of iron and bronze, and says when they break out of the wall, that will be the end of the world. Uh, and that is exactly what we find in Dulkarnain. In Surah 18, he goes to the land of the rising sun, the land of the setting sun, he builds a wall of iron and bronze to keep what he calls Yajud and Majud uh, at bay. And when they come out, it'll be the end of the world. So exactly the same story as appears in um, the Syriac legend of Alexander the Great appears in the Quran. So you have this, the Marwa as, uh, as the mountain upon which Abraham uh, was tested and the site of the Jerusalem temple. You've got Safa, which has got a significance for the, um, the Alexander the Great, who also appears. Wow, so the two, the, two of the most important figures in the Quran are connected to these two mountains or hills in Jerusalem. So that's, but, but that's quite more. a link. But there's more. Because the Quran doesn't just talk about these two hills. What it talks about is going between the two of them. Yeah. Well, between the two of them, you've got the Kidron Valley. Well, in the book of, uh, 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 of Joel, the prophet Joel, and again, in the, particularly, it talks about the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley where God will judge mankind, and that is traditionally understood as the Kidron Valley. 
it's more explicit than that. The book of Zechariah uh, specifically names um, the Mount of Olives. It said on the last day, the Messiah will come down on the Mount of Olives and he'll split it asunder and he'll create a, a great plain. And, and, and this is a scene that is described in the Quran. The Quran talks about on the last day, uh, grinding the mountains into dust and creating the great plain of Kiyama. So it's not just that Mar Marwa has, or Mar Mariah has significance for the Quran, it's not just that Safa has a significance for the Quran, but the valley between them has a significance for the Quran. It's a story that the Quran is almost its core message yeah. is to tell people about the day of judgment yeah. that will happen on this valley between Safa and Marwa. Yeah. But the Quran talks about uh, the conquest of, of an important place. Um, yes. Tell me about that. How does Jerusalem fit in with that in the 7th century? Well, the Quran tells us, what's, one thing it tells us about, about uh, the Masjid al-Haram, the place of, uh, this holy place of prostration, one thing it tells us is that it is a place from which the Quran's audience have been expelled and which they are ordered to fight to recapture. Well, in the traditional narrative, all this takes place in, in this rather um, imaginal world of uh, Bedouins and sand dunes, mar far from anywhere. But we know that the Quran was announced during a time of one of the greatest wars in human history. This 30-year war between the, uh, the Byzantines and the Persians, which has been called the last great war of antiquity. Yeah. Um, the longest conflict in human history is the battle or the conflict between the Romans and the Persians. It went on for something like 700 years and this 30-year war with its finale. And during the course of this war, the Persians captured Jerusalem and some Jews tried to re-establish worship at the temple. What year would that have that been? Would be 614. Yeah, so okay. So the war started 602, they captured Jerusalem in 614, and the Jews tried to re-establish worship on, on the Temple Mount. That's, it, that's quite interesting considering the time frame, because 16, 614 is right smack in the middle of the the supposed lifetime of Muhammad when he was meant to be carrying out his mission and here we have this conquest of Jerusalem yes, in 614. The, yes, the traditional life of Muhammad would say that he got his first revelation in the year 610. So 614 he would just have been getting into his stride. So as, as I say, it's not a coincidence that, that, that this great earth uh, changing event was taken, or series of events was taking place at the same time that the Quran was coming out. It's a, rather like um, somebody uh, finding a book that was written during the course of the Second World War that was making references to, uh, I don't know, the invasion, uh, the seaborne invasions, or the dropping of the atomic bomb, and someone says, oh, this obviously all relates to some, some completely isolated place in the middle of the desert. It doesn't make sense. It's, uh, it, it's ha the Quran was, um, was orientated toward these very great historical events happening to the north. And then there was another conquest of Jerusalem later in the yeah. century. Yes, yeah, 614 ended unhappily for the Jews. Uh, there was a rebellion by the Christians uh, and uh, many of the Jews were massacred. And, those, and when the uh, Persians restored order, they thought it was all too much trouble for them. And they asked the Jews, or they didn't ask the Jews, they, they chased the Jews out. They expelled the Jews from Jerusalem to basically to appease the Christians. So the Jews who left um, uh, would have been expelled from Jerusalem in 614. So does that fit in with the Quran's instruction that you should, uh, that its audience should expel the people from where they have themselves been expelled from? Well, yes, because the Arab conquests end up capturing Jerusalem in 638. Yes. So, oh. well, what, what a surprise that they, the, the place that the Quran is telling people to conquer is actually the very place that these followers did conquer. And it's interesting, Thomas the Presbyter um, wrote in 634 about the Tayyaye of Muhammad fighting a, a conflict east of Gaza and that would tie in with the conquest of Jerusalem. Obviously Jerusalem is just north of Gaza, northeast of Gaza. So that's an interesting tie-in with that which, which suggests that you're on the, the right track there with the conquest a tie, of a tie Jerusalem. In. A tie-in, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so, yeah, so I, in my, I've written an article. Uh, can I plug Yes, it? absolutely. It's, it's in, on the website called academia.edu, so academia.edu. And my article is called Islam 
I say it's called Jerusalem City of Islam by Paul Ellis and in it it's a very long article it's extraordinarily long it's a hundred pages but I've totted up 25 different reasons why the Masjid al-Haram has to be Jerusalem and it's not just a theory because I have in my pocket real hard physical evidence that my theory is correct may okay. I show you oh absolutely tell us this wait guys are you a quick pause for the battery change okay quick pause. yeah yeah right take two action so you've got a, a piece of evidence on you that backs up your Jerusalem thesis I do I bought this from a coin dealer this is uh, described as an Umayyad Fals, that's a copper coin. It's dated to round about the end of the 7th century. It says um, in the Arabic calendar 78 to 85, so that makes it round about 690s. And it's the coin minted probably during the reign of Abdul Malik, the, the, great, uh, the great caliph. And on it, if you can see, There is the unmistakable image of the menorah. The symbol the, of the temple. The, wow, the branched candlestick um, that is a symbol of Judaism and particularly a symbol of the temple. And you're telling me Abdul Al Malik minted that coin? Uh, we know it was a Muslim who minted the coin yeah. because it says along the top in Arabic, there is no God but Allah, just above wow. the Jewish menorah. And that, that actually t totally sinks the standard Islamic narrative there. So, if there are any Muslims watching this video who want to show me a coin minted in the first century of Islam that has a picture of the Kaaba on it, or anything to do with Mecca, or anything to do with the desert, I would love to hear from you. But when Abdul Malik wanted to symbolize his reign, he didn't look, go to the Hijaz, he didn't go into the Arabian Peninsula, he found a symbol of the Jerusalem temple and said, I want this symbol to represent my reign. Fantastic. And that would indicate then that the Kaaba and Mecca is all a later invention. Everything got transposed further south into Arabia. That's right. Um, and the shifting sands of Arabia. It's, uh, I think you, Mel, came up with the image of, um, of Las Vegas of a desert and a, as a blank page upon which you can write anything. If you go into the desert and there's no history and there are no people, yeah. not much in the way of planning control, there's yeah. certainly no planning control around Mecca. And no witnesses. And, <laughs> and no witnesses and no tradition to say, oh, this is wrong, no books. Yeah. You, uh, you can find a bit in the desert, you can find a tiny, tiny little trickle of water and you can say, that is a Zamzam well. You yeah. can find a flat bit of ground, and you can say, "Ah, oh, this is where this is where Abraham built the Kaaba." And you can find two totally nondescript rocky knolls, and you can say that one is Safa and that one is Marwa. And the significance is because, and then you can come up with some, some story. story. And interestingly, even the story of Hagar and Ishmael running back and forth between Safa and Marwa that doesn't even exist in the Bible. It doesn't exist in the Bible and it makes no sense. Yeah. Even within the context of the story, why if you are in the desert with a, with a child and you've run out of water, why would that possess you to run backward <laughs> and forward seven yeah. times? Yeah. I can see you might run twice looking for water. Yeah. I can see you might run a second time to make sure you haven't missed anything. Yeah. Yeah. Seven times? Yeah. It is just nonsense. It's yeah, a, yeah. It is a total nonsense story. Yeah. Um, and it's invented to give a reason for these two rocks which has happened to be oh we'll call that one Safa, that one Marwa to explain Safa and Marwa and but the reality is uh, the, the coincidence that Jerusalem the place that the Muslims did capture the place that is central to the stories that the Quran tells central to the story of, uh, of Solomon and Saul and David and Zacharias and Jesus central to all that and Mary uh, so central to all of them um, that, that has that is built yeah. on a on a hill that, is, that sounds yeah. like Marwa, and across the uh, valley of Kidron to the ha uh, mountain known as Safa. So what you're saying is all the biblical characters that the Quran refers to, they're all linked in one way or other with the city of Jerusalem, and yet none of these biblical characters have any link whatsoever with Mecca because 
Essentially, Mecca didn't exist before the 7th century. There's zero evidence of that. Mecca is not referred to as a city in the Bible in anywhere. You, you could argue that the word Mecca exists in a totally different context. Uh, there's a Hebrew word that sounds very like Mecca, but that is used to, to mean something else. It's not specifically a Hijazi city being referred to. I'll, I'll try my hand at another analogy. My, my 20th century analogies <laughs> don't always work terribly well. Yeah. But imagine you came across a book and it talked about George Washington and it talked about Thomas Jefferson and it talked about Abraham Lincoln and then it mentioned a White House. And you have to believe that, yes, this is the real George Washington, the real Thomas Jefferson, the real Abraham Lincoln, but when he talks about the White House, it's actually talking about a building in Mexico. That, that's what you have to believe, to yeah. think that, the, uh, that the, um, the, the sacred place of prostration was in the Hijaz and not in Jerusalem. Yeah. And it's interesting, and something just to kind of go back to that original conquest in 638, there's sources such as Sophronius that say that when the Arabs invaded Jerusalem, they set about building um, a place of prostration. Um, and Umar was the leader at the time, so we're talking about 637, 638. Mm -hmm. That would tie in with the idea that, that this is what the Masjid al-Haram is, is being referred to. Or would you say it's more uh, a generic term for Jerusalem? How would you...? I think uh, I, I, I would define it as uh, the sacred place of prostration. It doesn't have to be a building, because a place of prostration is simply a place. Yeah. It comes from the word uh, sajid, which means to, to prostrate yourself or to bow down. Yeah. And, uh, so yes, Jerusalem probably, could fit in with that, yeah. In, so it's a place of prostration. Yeah. So it could be a reference to the historical temple. It could be a place what? to the site where this temple used to stand. Yeah. It could be aspirational. It could be looking forward to the, the longed for temple that would that would yeah. come at some stage in the future. Yeah, and of course in, in the uh, Dome of the Rock there is um, what's known as the Sacra, which is a rock that was important to the Jews. And obviously in Islam, the black stone, the black rock, it, too, with the Kaaba, is considered sacred. But be long before that, the Jews considered this rock to be a sacred location. Now, why is that? Well, the, the rock around which the Dome of the Rock now stands um, is the natural, as I mentioned, the natural summit of Mount Moriah. So yeah. um, there is a very good book um, by, I'm getting the name there, uh, Lean, Lean, um, Right, I, I, I forget the gentleman's name. An, arche an archaeologist, he's probably on the uh, on the hub. But he's uh, he has demonstrated that this um, that this uh, stone, stone or rock or, or uh, the summit uh, was, which rises about eight feet above the surrounding platform. Yeah. So it's a, it really it does stick out. Yeah. And he's demonstrated that this was where they built the original temple. You can actually see the marks on it yeah. where the wall of the temple used to yeah. be, the wall of the Holy of Holies. Yeah. So if you look at a picture of the rock that's in the centre of the Dome of the Rock, yeah. you can actually see um, three uh, rectangular carved indentations um, that are aligned with each other and he says that's where the foundation wall of the Holy yeah. of Holies was. Yeah. It literally was the foundation stone of the temple. Yeah. And uh, that's sacred so, to Jews and of course Christians. It, um, we don't look on the temple quite the same way but um, Christians accept that the temple was the temple up until yeah. the moment that Jesus yeah. dies yeah. in the Gospels. Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose, I suppose Jesus kind of made the transition in a sense by saying, in, in relate, talking to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And that kind of fitted in with the, that Jewish terminology that the old religion was built on that foundation rock where Abraham was said to have brought Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. And uh, yeah, so it, it retains that significance. Oh, absolutely. In, um, in the Gospel of St. Luke, it, um, it talks about Zacharias, the, the, the priest, um, administering before God. And later on, with the presentation of the temple, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to present him to God. So in the Gospels, it sees the temple as still being the house of God right up until the moment when Jesus dies. And when Jesus dies on the cross, um, the, the symbolic, um, the, 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 the significance of it is captured with the rending of the veil of the temple in two. The veil of the temple makes is the third wall, or the fourth wall of the queue. So when you rend that, 
then the cube of the Holy of Holies is no longer needed and no longer needed to be a, a cube. And so for Christians, that's the, uh, that's the, the, the end of the temple. But for the Muslims, obviously not. They still regard it as a holy, holy place. One of the um, passages in the Quran that some people point out as an error is the idea that Mary was a sister of Aaron. And they say, well, that's, that cannot be. They've made an obvious mistake there. But you've got a, another take on that. Would you like to talk us about that and how it connects with the idea of Jerusalem? Yes, a few years ago, um, a, a scholar called Guillaume D, uh, surname is D Y E, uh, a Belgian, Belgian scholar, wrote an article, and he demonstrated that he, he drew reference to a an early Christian source known as the Lectionary of Jeremiah. It's going to get a little bit technical. The Lectionary of Jeremiah draws attention to Mary as the as the equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant had the Ten Commandments placed within it and it was symbolic of God's covenant with the Israelites. Yeah. Mary, in the lectionary of Jeremiah, is depicted as living in the temple or being brought up within the temple in the Holy of Holies and her womb is effectively the Ark of the Covenant. Because Jesus being the, co the new covenant, because, essentially. Yeah, because Jesus yeah. is the new covenant wow. and so Mary's womb takes the same role as the Golden Ark of the Covenant in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. Um, now, in this lectionary of Jeremiah, <laughs> the author tries to make a rather clever little point. Yeah. Um, and when he's talking about Moses and Aaron, he refers to Aaron uh, as, um, as being the brother of Miriam. Well, of course, he was, because he did have a sister who was called Miriam. Yeah. And the author of this lectionary of Jeremiah was just trying to make a clever little point that Aaron was the sister of Miriam, and then Mary, later on, would take over the role of the Ark of the Covenant. As Aaron had been the priest of the temple, Mary then becomes effectively the temple for the, uh, uh, for the new covenant. So he's just trying to make a rather clever little point. So there. it's a parallel. So by calling Mary uh, of the New Testament the sister of Aaron, the idea is that the same way as she was the Ark of the New Covenant, Aaron was the Ark of the Old Covenant. Would that it would be that the, the take well, you would uh, give? Yes, in, in the book of Exodus, um, Moses is the is the prophet and the lawgiver and the leader of the people, and his brother Aaron becomes a priest and is a descendant of Aaron who become the priestly um, functionary of the priestly class. So basically this lectionary of Jeremiah the author makes this rather clever but throwaway point that oh by the way Aaron is the brother of, 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 of Mary and uh, before he goes on to, to talk about Mary well the Quran author is obviously aware of this because when he has Mary um, talking to her people they address her as sister of Aaron so it's a literary allusion to the lectionary of Jeremiah. But you have to know the lectionary of Jeremiah to get to get the reference. So that, that actually blows a massive hole in the standard Islamic narrative because the standard Islamic narrative would say Muhammad is illiterate. But an illiterate person doesn't know these um, elusive passages in books and, and, and fragments and so on. Okay, you could argue it's possible to know at least some of these orally, but that to me sounds like someone who's well aware of many written sources. Oh, the, 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 whoever wrote the Quran, or if it was more than one person, whoever wrote it um, well, was not illiterate. Um, it was hugely um, erudite. It draws on passages from the Old Testament, passages from the New Testament, the Book of Enoch, Cave of Treasures, the uh, Lectionary of Jeremiah, uh, passages from the Talmud, taken straight from the Talmud. I even found uh, a law of Justinian in the Quran. It, it just takes bits from everywhere. A bit like a magpie, just drawing from all, all sides, and yet trying to find a new synthesis, which is quite a big intellectual project to, to kind of synthesize all of that. But all of the material that you're, you're, you're mentioning, all of these sources, they're all coming from the north. They're all coming from places like Israel, from Syria, Iraq, those sort of locations, places where people spoke Aramaic. They all come from the Judeo-Christian culture. And yeah. the Quran is obviously comes from the Judeo-Christian culture. It couldn't make it any more obvious. Um, all these references to the biblical characters, Adam and, uh, and Noah and Moses and Abraham and Jesus and Mary and the apostles, it couldn't make it any more obvious that this is a Judeo-Christian um, 
text or it wants to see itself yeah. as being the next installment possibly the final installment of this of this um, um, revelation history that's how the Quran author sees plus, it plus the other it thing is, it is absolutely not um, somebody who says um, like my example with Washington and Jefferson somebody who says oh have you heard the story of Adam have you heard the story of no Mo Noah have you heard the story of Moses well um, I'm going to tell you about a totally different story down here in, in the Arabian desert uh, talking to a whole load of uh, yeah. pagans it, it doesn't make any sense yeah I was going to make the point that the Quran presumes that its audience knows these stories already yes so it's clearly not in the context of a population of pagans. It's in the context of a population of people who already know the Jewish stories, already knows the Christian stories. It's not making the case for those stories. What it's doing is it's giving a new interpretation, a new uh, synthesis of these stories. But it already assumes the audience knows the stories because um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't really retell any of these stories. It just makes allusions to them, and that seems to be enough. The audience already knows the stories. Yes, it changes. It changes some bits. Yeah. Um, for example, it has Jacob as the as a third son of Abraham, rather than Abraham's grandson through Isaac. So it, it makes some changes, um, but it's, it's always with a purpose. It is a very clever document. It is very very sophisticated, and. Um, we are now discovering this. It's a very, very exciting time. Uh, you, you, you're excited, <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. Because we are, it feels like we are reading the Quran for the first time. When I read this stuff, I think you know, there, there are only maybe 100 or 200 people in the world who know what we know about it. Yeah. It is so clever, so sophisticated, yeah. and yet Muslims uh, are, are entirely um, constrained by the traditional and now totally debunked narrative all they do is learn and reiterate the same old stories yeah. that don't make but, any sense but they're look but they're looking at that quran through the lens of a very cleverly created narrative that basically filters how they read it but yes. if they if they were to remove that filter and and look at the historical sources and look at the context, they might be, ap be able to draw from it a totally different interpretation, a more realistic one that fits in with the time in which it was written. And that's, I think, something that you are, are, are heavily at work trying to discover. Absolutely. As I say, it's a very, very exciting time. An awful lot of people out there who are not Muslims, not critical of Muslims, like the Islamic narrative. They, yeah. uh, people like, for example, David Woods or um, the Apostate Prophet or uh, Robert, uh, Robert Spencer. Um, they, 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 they reiterate the traditional Islamic sources, the Sirah and the Hadith, because, to be frank, these make Muhammad look like a terrible person. Yeah, they yeah. make him look like a common criminal, like a brigand. He's robbing caravans. He's killing his enemies and taking their wives for his harem. He's yeah. having sex with girls, with uh, six-year-old or nine-year-old girls, and he's uh, and he's marrying his daughter-in-law. He's doing really, massacring his prisoners, torturing Kinana to find out where the gold is kept. He does really terrible things. So if you want to attack Islam. Um, you can't do any better than go for the traditional Islamic yeah, narrative, <laughs> which makes Muhammad yeah, it's look like terrible. It's like shooting fish in a barrel when you're dealing with, with, with those sort of stories. But the reality is so much more complicated yeah. and so much more interesting yeah. and so much more um, positive because really we should get everybody in the world should read the Quran and, and should read it in the light of what we now know. And, and it's, a, it's a completely transformed experience once you see it as a historical document of a, a self-appointed uh, prophet and warlord who wants to capture Jerusalem. And you read it in that sense, uh, so much of it that doesn't make sense, either to Muslims or to non-Muslims, yeah. suddenly creates, suddenly makes yeah. sense and when the, you see it in the proper historical yeah. context. And just kind of to reiterate a few other sort of things that kind of fit in with everything that you just said, is the fact that the word Quran itself it's not originally an Arabic word, it's a borrowed Aramaic word, Kiriano, which means lectury. Yes. And Odin Lafontaine makes the case that what is being discussed by the Quran as the Quran is in fact another book. It's a, a project to translate a lectionary for the Arabs into their, their own tongue, their, their mother tongue, the, into Arabic. So they're talking about uh, translating an, an Aramaic lectionary into Arabic. Um, and this is part of a Judeo-Christian uh, uh, religion. 
Um, if we shoot forward to the 8th and 9th centuries, we see that this project has gone off in a different direction now. Uh, we, we start to see the introduction of hadiths and sirahs. Um, there, there has been a big change in the world history because of the Arab conquests. Um, they're, they're intermingling with people in North Africa, they're intermingling with people in Persia, and they're, they're absorbing those religious ideas from those cultures. And it's, 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 it's basically, it's grafting itself onto uh, a different culture now. And, and we can see why it's so easy for the original meaning to be lost in all of that mix. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, what happened um, after the Quran was completed is still a great mystery. Uh, but it, it seems to me that... Oh, thank you very much, Mark. It, it seems, seems to me that, what, um, that one plausible scenario is that these, uh, these uh, rightly guided caliphs uh, weren't actually um, followers of Muhammad at all. Um, Abu Bakr may well have usurped Muhammad. It's good reason, I think, to find that. Um, uh, Umar, we don't know. Um, Uthman was actually the first Umayyad um, caliph, yeah. and there's no and there's no sign that the Umayyads um, did anything at all about Islam for for 60 years at least, at least 60 years. Not one engraving, not one coin, not one book. They, they didn't for 60 years from the supposed death of Muhammad in 630 to round about 632. The 600, <laughs> well, there, about the 630s, right up until 690s. Yeah. Not a single Ara Arabic inscription anywhere. Not li later on, you get milestones arise, uh, being found, and you get the odd coin with Arabic mos uh, Quranic mottos on. But up for 60 years, nothing. So it's a kind of a yeah, radio cannot, silence. I cannot believe that these people um, were actually Muslims. Because if you, if you were setting up a, 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 an empire in the name of religion, you would want to tell everyone about it. What religious yeah. person doesn't? But the thing is, if you look at the coins, you, you, you've shown us an example of a coin there er, uh, earlier on. But like if you look at many of the coins during the Umayyad era, you have crosses on the coins. Yeah. Um, and, and that makes no sense if the standard Islamic narrative is true. If Muhammad set up this religion um, and it's basically anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, we should not be seeing crosses on their coins. We should not be seeing menorahs on their coins. That, that suggests that there's something seriously wrong with the story that Muslims have been teaching everyone, and telling everyone, yes. and, and there's something else that's been happening in the seventh century. Yes, it's, it is the greatest lie. The, the, the traditional Islamic narrative is not somebody exaggerating, and somebody being a little bit creative and trying to spin a bit of a yarn. It is, there's no doubt it's a deliberate lie, it's a concoction, and it has fooled now Today is ruling one quarter of the world's population, a fifth or a quarter of the world's population, and the uh, and it's been repeated and repeated and embellished and expanded upon for 1,400 years. And you and I, you and I are bubbling it. Yeah, um, the Muslims have just completed um, Eid al-Fitr. Um, I believe it was yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. They've done their 30 days fast. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise is that about 2,500 something years ago, uh, Nabonidus um, had a 30 day fast and it was called, Al the, the, the feast at the end of it was called Al-Fitr. And it's actually referred to in the Bible where um, the, uh, the writing is on the wall passage where um, Balthazar was having a feast and he was told that basically his kingdom would come to an end and the Persians were, were going to take over. And the reason was because they're having this feast using utensils from the temple, there's another Jerusalem connection, <coughs> but also because the feast was dedicated to the um, Mesopotamian uh, god, moon god, Sin. Um, and so you couldn't, couldn't make it up. You couldn't make <laughs> this stuff up. Um, now, some people might say, well, where's your proof? Well, back in the 1940s, 1950s, archaeologists in Haran were digging up the foundations of an ancient mosque there, and they found four stella. And on those four stella were inscriptions from two and a half thousand years ago. And on those stella, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the father of Balthasar, announces 
that he is spreading the cult of sin where? In Arabia, right? Um, and so what we have in, in, in Islam, and this is so um, unheard of among Muslims don't know this, is that they have borrowed a, a clearly pagan cult that the Bible has condemned and they have incorporated it into their religion. The Muslims are going around clapping each other on the back for fasting for 30 days, well really feasting twice a day and, and having an intermittent yes. fast in between. Binge, binge eating. But they've, they've taken um, um, a festival which was originally dedicated to a clearly pagan god and it wasn't just a monotheistic god, it was um, uh, a Meso Mesopotamian trilogy of gods or a triad of gods, um, one of them being a moon god, another being a sun god. And yet they've managed to incorporate that into a religion that's supposedly monotheistic. Another, another thought, is that, uh, it, it, sometimes people say, well, absence of evidence isn't the same thing as evidence of absence, but sometimes it is. And I'll tell you one example where that we have evidence of absence, and that is um, the Battle of the Trench. According to the traditional Islamic narrative, one of the great battles was in Yatrib, and the defenders uh, dealt, uh, defended themselves by digging a big trench around the city, a trench big enough to hold an army out. Yeah. Now, it has to be a heck of a trench, because trenches don't hold armies back, um, if it, if it, even if it's like 10 feet deep. Um, there's still an army who's going to get across that. If it's going to be a siege, it's going to last a few days. You know, they just have to pick their moment and, and get across. A, 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 ditch in, a ditch is not going to hold, hold an army back by itself. But that's what we're led to believe. So it must have been a really big old trench. Well, where is it? Yeah. Uh, did, did somebody come along and fill in this trench? <laughs> where is it? Did somebody show me where the trench was? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it makes no sense that anyone would come along afterwards and say, let's review all the evidence of this trend, let's, yeah. let's level it up. Yeah. So it's not there, and the reason it's not there yeah. is because there was no, there was never any battle for yeah. the trench. No, I know, I can see what some people are thinking watching this video. We are a pair of conspiracy theorists and we're coming up with some crazy idea, but just look at the evidence. Look at the fact that the narrative wasn't written down for at least 150, 200 years. Plenty of time for stories to naturally evolve doesn't require much of a conspiracy. You, you might call it a lie. I might be a bit more generous and I might say, well, these are just gradual variations in the stories, a bit like Chinese whispers where stories get a little bit carried away. And then if they have moved everything down to Mecca, stories would have to automatically change to, um, to relate to the context. Um, also the fact that they want to keep the biblical uh, characters and stories they're going to have to change an awful lot of the story to make it fit and they need to have a lot of cover stories to try and um, cover the holes in the narrative. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, all I say is we are, we're not conspiracy theorists. The, the conspiracy is, is the, the evidence, uh, is the, the standard Islamic narrative that has no evidence to support it. We are looking at the evidence and we are finding the true, the true meaning of the Quran. And the Quran is an awful lot, makes an awful lot more sense when you read it against a Judeo-Christian background, which is what itself asks its readers to do than it does if you read it in a, in a pagan Arab context. Yeah. And the <laughs> story of Muhammad that, that emerges is a very much more um, creditable story. I, I, I think it's quite possible that Muhammad genuinely believed that he was a prophet in the guise or in, in the tradition of Moses or um, a leader in the tradition of Joshua. I think he saw himself in that way. He's referring to um, these the, uh, Old Testament um, sources and he's presenting himself in that light and he's trying to capture Jerusalem and he's trying to in, uh, impose Old Testament um, laws on the people in that area it, because he thinks that's God's will and that's a much much better Put impression than the traditional narrative that has him acting like a, like some uh, yeah. brigands and uh, some highwaymen. Yeah, moment. but he, so the Muhammad you were referring to is not the Muhammad of those traditions, the Muhammad of the standard Islamic narrative. We're talking about a different guy in a different location, a cultured guy, yes, with, very, with a, a, a very, wide very, knowledge of literary sources, perhaps with some rabbinical uh, links. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there's a strong evidence that there's Jewish links there and in fact the coin that you they showed obviously would back that up 
Um, Red Judaism has done a lot of work on the Jewish links. He sees a very strong Jewish connection there with, with the Quran. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, as I say, it's a very, very exciting uh, project to read the Quran and to feel that we are reading the Quran for the first time, we are uncovering its true meaning um, for the first time since probably since it was written. Uh, well, since, since a few years after it was written. It's, uh, it's a very exciting project to be alive and it's great, great to be uh, part of the team. <laughs>